I thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this session. My name is Mohammad Tawhid Rahman. I am an assistant professor from Florida International University. So this session will mainly talk about um, use of AI versus leakage. So there is a slight change in the order. So our first presentation is 12.3. It's, it's, uh, it's a triplet power deep learning side chain attacks over few traces. So our speaker is uh, Dr. Wang. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, he received uh, two PhD degrees, uh, one from uh, University of Arizona in 2017 and one from uh, Zhejiang University uh, in cryptography in 2014. His current research focuses on data security and privacy, side chain attacks, machine learning, network security, and applied cryptography. He has published more than 50 peer-reviewed papers at high-quality conferences and journals. Dr. Wang's research is supported by uh, NSF, IU Techs, and Ohio Cyber Range. He received NSF uh, CRI proposals. Uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Wang for his talk. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk. Again, uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm Bo Yang. I'm a assistant professor from the University of Cincinnati. And the title of my talk today is Triplet Power, uh, Deep Learning and Side Channel Attacks Over a Few Traces. And this is a joint work with my students, uh, Chen Gang Wang, uh, Jimmy Danny, Shane Riley, Austin Brownfield, and also my colleague, Dr. Marty Emmert. All right, so first, a little bit background in terms of side channel. So again, the assumption here is we have attacker. Um, this attacker can monitor the power consumption on a target. For example, a microcontroller running encryption algorithms such as AES-128. And by doing that, this attacker can recover encryption keys. And again, you may wonder why is that? Because fundamentally, there is a correlation between power consumption and also the intermediate values of encryption algorithms, such as the output of uh, AES, SBOX, or subbytes. Um, so in the past several years, uh, a lot of uh, papers, uh, lab studies leverage machine learning, especially deep learning to perform uh, side channel attacks. So by doing that, it also uh, it offers several advantages um, compared to traditional attacks. So for example, uh, it uh, does not require more, uh, less pre-processing over power traces. Uh, it can also defeat countermeasures such as random delays or masking. And if you train a very good model with a large number of traces, then you can recover keys with a small number of traces during the attack phase. On the other hand, one of the limitations here by using deep learning here in side channel attacks is in general it requires a large number of training traces to train a good model, okay? However, uh, but um, in many cases, we know that this can be difficult to achieve, especially if you consider attacker could have a, a short time window to actually collect sufficient number of traces, especially in the non-profiling uh, non attack. All right, so this is uh, what we do in this study here. So basically, we propose a new deep learning side channel attack here which requires a small number of training traces. So the main idea here is we leverage triplet networks to learn a more robust embedding. And by doing that, we only uh, need hundreds of training traces. And our method works for profiling attacks uh, in both same device and cross device scenario. It also works for non-profiling attacks here if we extend that with uh, on-the-fly labeling. Uh, so some of the main uh, observations or research findings from our experiments. So we actually collect data from um, microcontrollers uh, running AES-128 by using chip whisper. So as you can see here for X mega, uh, 
our method only requires 250 training choices. And on the other hand, CNN requires at least 4,000 training choices. And similar observations from STM32, our method requires uh, only 500 training choices, uh, but CNN requires at least uh, 8,000 training choices. All right, so a little bit more background in terms of side channel here. So in general, we have profiling uh, attacks and also non-profiling attacks. So in uh, profiling attack here, so normally assumption here is we assume an attacker. So there are two uh, devices, one training device and one uh, target device or uh, test device. So we assume that this attacker can uh, capture uh, plant taxes, uh, choices, and also knows a key from this training device. Uh, can train a classifier and uh, later on during the attack phase, this attacker can capture plant tags and choices from a test device and trying to recover the key from this test device. And we could have two uh, scenarios. One is uh, s same device setting. That means that basically um, we have a single device. It actually serves as a training uh, device and test device. And we can also have this cross device scenario where um, the training device and test device are not identical. And in this case, in, uh, in many cases, we actually phase uh, distribution shifts between the training data and test data uh, due to the hardware and the key um, discrepancies between the two devices. Then in addition to that, we can also have non-profiling attack here. So in this case, attacker does not have this training device anymore. It only has uh, this test device, it can capture the choices, plan text, uh, and this attacker is trying to recover the key. So obviously there's no um, profile in, in this case. And then all the choices are actually unlabeled. And obviously this is more challenging compared to profiling attacks in general. And so when we say a power trace in this study, that means uh, fundamentally this is, uh, you can think of it as a sequence of power samples or measurements, so when this uh, target runs encryption algorithms, uh, so particularly AES-128 in this study. And for the leakage step, we uh, leverage AES, the first round of AES-128 and the sub-bytes, uh, or S-box. And for the intermediate values, we use the outputs uh, from this uh, sub-bytes uh, from the first round. And uh, so in general, for a, a side channel attacks on AES, it uh, reveals uh, keys byte by byte, so meaning that every single time you basically recover one byte, and if you have 16 bytes, you can actually repeat the attack 16 times, and you can re reveal the entire key. And or in other words, when I try to uh, recover the key here every single time, if you target one byte, that means you have 256 uh, possible keys. And points of interest means that uh, on all the corresponding uh, samples or measurements that are actually associated with uh, he has the first round of uh, sub-bytes, um, so that's uh, the concept here. And in our study, we use Hemingway model. That means we assume that there is a correlation between power consumption and also the Hemingway of the intermediate value of this encryption, which is the outputs of sub-bytes in this case. And so then from machine learning perspective, that means for each trace, the label is basically the Hemingway of this uh, intermediate result. And overall, obviously, we have nine uh, classes. Um, and for the evaluation, we use key ranking or uh, guessing entropy here. So that means key ranking means the rank of the correct key among all the 256 uh, possible keys. And if the key rank is zero, that means you can recover the key uh, correctly. And we use R here to actually indicate the number of test traces uh, during the attack phase that we actually need for the key ranking to actually converge to zero. So at that point, you know that you can actually recover the key given the uh, number of test, uh, test traces. All right, then for our method here, so again, this is based on triple network. And the basic idea of this triple network uh, is that it actually includes three sub network in parallel. And during the training, they actually share the uh, same weights. And all the corresponding inputs here for this triplet network here, uh, so those are triplets. Each triplet includes uh, one anchor trace, uh, one positive trace, and also a negative trace. 
And so the anchor trays and uh, positive trays, uh, they're actually selected from the same class or the same hemming weight. And anchor and the negative, they're actually selected from uh, different classes or different hemming weights. And then during the training, the goal here is to actually train a embedded space such that the distance between a anchor and a positive is smaller than the distance between an anchor and the negative. So that's, that's the goal during the training. And after that, we can actually extract the subnetwork and we attach, uh, for example, K and N at the very end that we can actually perform the classification for the side channel attack. So that's basically the main idea here uh, for a profiling attack. So once we have that, we can go ahead and further extend it to non-profiling attack. So what we do here is now we assume that we have, let's say, a number of N plus V unlabeled traces. So now what we do here is we're gonna guess the corresponding key, right? So let's assume that uh, we guess the key is zero, zero. Then we generate the corresponding labels for all those um, plus V unlabeled traces, okay? Now we train a classifier based on the previous method we mentioned. Then we test uh, the classifier, uh, classifier, excuse me. Then we obtain the corresponding accuracy over a number of uh, V test traces. And once we have that, we have the corresponding accuracy for that one classifier. Then we repeat that guessing, the labeling, the training and testing. Then we uh, repeat it 256 times, each one was, each time was a different key guess. Then at the very end, we have 256 classifiers and we also have 256 accuracy. So once we have that, then the next step here, basically what we do here is we leverage accuracy as the distinguisher. Uh, so the assumption here is that if the classifier was actually trained with the correct key guess, then it sh should have the highest accuracy. On the other hand, if a classifier was actually trained with the incorrect key guess, then um, the accuracy is similar as random guess. Or in other words, there's no uh, correlation between power consumption and the, uh, uh, the intermediate, the Hamming weight of the intermediate results. So one thing we, I do want to mention here is, so again, I, we actually use Hemingway model. So one thing I want to point out here is, if you do want to leverage on the fly labeling or fundamentally partition-based differential power analysis, uh, you shouldn't use ID model because if you use ID model here every single time, it doesn't matter what's the value of your key guess, every single time you have the same partitions over those uh, unlabeled traces and there's no statistic difference um, among all those 256 uh, key guess. And then based on that, we collect some data. So um, we basically collect data, again, as I mentioned, from microcontrollers by using the chip whisperer. So we have two sets here, as you can see, one for a same device setting and one for a cross device setting. And with that, we can also have uh, traces for non profiling attacks as well. So overall, we provide almost one million power traces and uh, so here are some examples of the power traces from different targets. We identify those points of interest uh, in advance. And this is kind of like an overview of the data sets we have. And as you can see, we have uh, traces from XMega and MASK, uh, STM32 and MASK, uh, XMega uh, and MASK with random delay as well. And here are the corresponding keys we leverage during the uh, data collection. Some of the key results, uh, so first, uh, profiling attack, the same device setting. Uh, if we train traces from XMega and test uh, traces with XMega from the same, exactly the same device, as you can see here, uh, with our method, uh, we only need, so overall observation here is we, uh, our method needs uh, less uh, training traces than CNN. So as you can see, when N is 250, or in other words, the number of training traces, 250 hour method can actually recover the key later on during the attack phase. However, on the other hand, for CNN, it requires at least 4,000 training traces to actually train a good model later on in the attack phase to recover the key. And one thing I do want to mention here is if, uh, if you do have sufficient number of training traces, then you should use CNN directly rather than our method because our method actually requires longer training time. But again, if you have small number of training traces, then our method does provide some advantages. And similar observation from another data set here, uh, when we have power traces from Musk AES128, uh, 
which was implementing assembly. So as you can see in this evaluation here, our uh, method requires one, um, 25, 20 traces. On the other hand, CNN requires at least 2,020 traces. Uh, we do have more additional results in the paper. So now move on to non-profiling attack here. So just to give you a couple of examples, as you can see here, if we use our method uh, by uh, extending that with on the fly labeling here, for X mega and mask AES, if we only have 250 unlabeled traces, and the, set, the attack was not successful. Or in other words, we cannot distinguish the, uh, the correct, the classifier twin with the correct key uh, from the uh, classifiers from incorrect yes. On the, on the other hand, if now if we increase the number of unlabeled traces to 500, and as you can see here, now we can actually distinguish the correct key from the uh, incorrect keys. And again, we focus on the third uh, key byte of AES128. And here are some uh, couple more examples uh, from non-profiling attacks here from different uh, data sets. So the, the one on the left is X mega unmask AES with random delay, so in this case, we need uh, 2,000 unlabeled traces. And the one on the right is STM32 unmask AES, and here, as you can see, with 500 unlabeled traces, we can distinguish the key. Uh, so next, limitations. Uh, so one thing I do wanna mention here is, uh, you as, as you can see here, our method actually requires much longer training time, so because when you train a sub uh, triple A network here, so each sub network Fundamentally, you can think of it as convolutional neural network and they share the same ways, so it takes much longer time to train. And for, for example, if we have 500 uh, traces from X mega in the profiling attack, it requires about 1,300 seconds, which is not bad. But now if we extend it to non-profiling attack, it's about four days. So one of the future directions we would like to work on is to reduce the model and um, optimize the training time, and we actually have some methods, and we can actually reduce the training time significantly by 90 or 95 percent, and hopefully we can include some of those results in the next paper. And uh, for this study, we focus on power, we did not evaluate EM. And another thing I wanna mention here is, um, there was another paper from uh, Chess uh, last year. Uh, they actually, they, they were the first one utilized triple network in the context of side channel attacks. Uh, so very similar idea here. So uh, they actually leverage triple network to actually learn robust embedding for template attack here. Uh, but their main goal was to actually try to reduce the training time with just a couple of epochs with a large number of training traces. Uh, so unfortunately, we were not aware of that paper during the uh, time of submission, but it's very interesting work and we do recommend you to take a look at that one as well. Um, so overall, from the results and findings from both papers, we think that, uh, so in general, AAA network can uh, offer good opportunities for side channel attacks in the general, uh, in general, and we do hope that there are more observations that we can obtain uh, from AAA networks. So that's all I have for today, and uh, next I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Hello, Doctor. I'm Asutosh Kimire from Wright State University. And uh, thank you so much for this uh, interesting presentation of the research, uh, which has a uh, good result with uh, very few traces. And uh, I was uh, curious to know, like, uh, why, I mean, is there any special uh, reason that you uh, focus on, like, is there any re special reason to focus on power traces rather than other? side channels, uh, because other side channels ha also has the traces uh, that can be useful to the deep learning, so. Uh, so, uh, so if I understand correctly, your question is why we're just using power rather than, for example, e EM or uh, yes, other sir. side channel. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, very good question. So here, again, as I mentioned, we did not evaluate data sets over EM. Also, right now, we actually have some results based on this over EM, I think. Um, for instance, for EM, if you have, uh, compared to power, obviously, you have higher noise, and in, in that case, at least from our results, um, I, I think uh, triplet also 
offers like a very good opportunity. The model is relatively more robust uh, compared to C, and especially if you have less number of choices. Uh, I, I think fundamentally because triplet is actually based on um, distance learning, I think it offers a very good opportunity for, especially for a side channel, because basically you just want to distinguish the correct key from incorrect ones. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, I doctor. Hope that answered your question. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, I have one quick question. So, uh, okay, yeah. With the models that you developed, do you have uh, false negatives, false positives, and how accurate are your, your models? Um, so again, if I understand correctly, I guess you are asking, um, false. you mean when we actually try to recover the key, right? Um, I think again, as if I go back a little bit, it, um, so it depends on the model, and in addition to that, as you can see, and we still need a certain number of choices to actually generate the triplets, for example. And if you have, let's say in this particular example, if you only have 250, um, as you can see here, you cannot actually distinguish the key correctly. But if you increase that a little bit, if you have more triplets, it actually offers the opportunity for the triplet to actually learn a better embedding and uh, you could so it's basically two cases, whether you can distinguish the key or not. So um, I hope that answers your question. And then the, the, the model that you develop doesn't correspond to the uh, traces that you have. Am I right? Uh, I'm the, sorry. The, the models that you develop do not correspond to the, the traces, yes? or um, so, so for the input, again, every single time is a triplet. You will need to have an anchor trace. You have a positive trace and negative trace. Uh, so anchor and the positive, they're actually selected from the same class where they have the same Hamming weight. And anchor and the negative, they actually have different Hamming weights. And there are actually many different ways you can actually select those triplets to potentially offer better opportunities as well. We only evaluate just one way to select those triplets. Um, so th that's another, I guess, a limitation for triplet here is, so you also need some time to actually mine those triplets such that you can actually um, potentially have a better opportunity to learn a better embedding model. So that takes some time as well. You can do on the fly or you can also uh, do that in advance as well. So that also adds some additional overhead in terms of the uh, training time, if I may. Okay, thanks, thanks. I will follow up with you after. Yeah, thank well, you. thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for your nice talk. Um, our first talk was focused on attacks. Our second talk focuses on uh, defense. Let's welcome um, uh, our second speaker. Um, um, second speaker. Um, uh, Anju, uh, he is a PhD student mm -hmm. at uh, North Carolina State University. Um, he is currently working with uh, Dr. Arjun Aishu. His research interests include uh, machine learning, physical threat chain attacks, and computer architecture. He has made numerous contributions in the area of side channel security for machine learning hardware. Let's welcome uh, Andrew for his uh, defense speech. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Rahman. Okay, so a small note before uh, I start this talk. So. Our paper is slightly different from the general theme of this session, which is uh, using machine learning to attack hardware. We are attacking machine learning using side channel attacks, basically focusing on that problem. Our main work is on defending such attacks, but yeah, using side channel attacks to attack machine learning. So this is joint work with uh, my collaborators from Intel Labs, and um, we are funded for this project from SRC and NSF in parts. Okay. So here's the basic setup of the problem statement where Alice is a model developer and wants to commercialize her developed models for which she deploys it on a user platform. The user platform is uh, obviously you know, some hardware and since it's hardware, we all know that it is going to leak inside channels. Eve, who is a malicious user of this platform, wants to extract the internals of the model that is deployed on this 
uh, user platform, and that's where Bob enters the picture and tries to solve this problem. Okay. Um, now, one may ask, why do we need to protect machine learning models? Why is this important? The reason is these machine learning models are valuable. They have, th they are like an intellectual property, mainly because of the costs that are involved in developing models. There is a fair amount of research and development that goes into developing uh, or coming up with good models. The training data might not be freely available, and training being a computationally intensive process requires specialized hardware, so that's another investment. So you would not want to spend all this money and you know so much hard work for years to just be stolen using a side channel attack that nearly takes a few hours. There are many, many papers in the last few years that have shown that this is indeed possible, even on commercial accelerators like Intel's neural stick. Okay. Um, now, there also has been a small amount of research on developing defenses, uh, but those defenses right now are mainly focusing on developing this hardware module, which is side channel hardened. So we have a neural network accelerator hardware, and that hardware internally applies all sorts of techniques like masking and hiding to you know, prevent such malicious reverse engineering of neural networks. We take a different approach here. We want to um, f you know, complete the full stack and develop a solution. So the current solutions right now focus on hardware, but our vision in this project is slightly different. So it's, it's almost like you know, in, in the x86 architecture, we have the AES-NI instruction, right, which automatically maps to the secure coprocessor that is running the crypto. We want to have a similar solution for side channel secure inferences of neural networks, because that would make it more and more accessible for an application developer to use machine learning on any hardware securely. So you want to abstract the whole security part from the application developer's point of view and just you know provide simple APIs so that this becomes possible. So yeah, we go all the way from the hardware stack to the ML application level. Our contributions, we developed the first hardware software co-design framework for machine learning uh, inferences that are secure. Um, we apply a couple of techniques to optimize um, such inferences. We, and I'll be talking about these two techniques later in the presentation. One is selective masking, where we provide this um, option to the machine learning developer to mask or unmask certain layers. This is important because much transfer learning is popularly used today in machine learning, and you might not want to you know, save or secure the parameters from the initial layers, right? because that's already public the only important part in those neural networks would be the final layer. And having a feature like that will really help to save performance and area instead of masking the whole neural network. We also apply this technique of data path reuse, and I'll be talking about that uh, later in the slides. And then we implement the whole system on a chip, and we empirically validate it using both DPA, which are the model-based side channel attacks, and model-less TVLA attacks. Okay, so a couple of basic concepts which uh, I'll uh, quickly brush through. Uh, we start with binarized neural networks. The main difference from traditional neural networks in this type is that the weights and activations are binarized to only plus and minus one. This helps to reduce the area and power and memory footprint and is really friendly when you have um, an embedded application as the use case. It's gaining a lot of popularity in the industry and uh, we believe it's a good starting point. However, in our paper, we also provide solutions for uh, higher quantization levels, like four bit and eight bit, and you're, um, I'll be happy to refer you to my manuscript for that. We also focus on securing the parameters in this case, rather than the hyperparameters, uh, and that's following the prior works. Um, the main reason is parameters are more lucrative because they are millions in number compared to hyperparameters, which might be, you know, so more standardized and uh, not really uh, as important as extracting the parameters. The second technique uh, that we use is um, hardware masking. We have had a couple of sessions on hardware masking. Uh, the main idea is instead of using the actual secret on hardware, we split the secret into two statistically independent shares, and that breaks the correlation from um, the f uh, correlation between the secret value and the power traces, because now we are not really working on the secret anymore, but rather only on two random numbers. If we do it on bits, it's called Boolean masking. If we do it on uh, larger composite numbers, which have multiple bits, 
we can just extend this to arithmetic masking. That's just you know the naming convention. And we need to use both of these techniques in our design because we do have um, both arithmetic and Boolean operations inside a neural network. All right, so that's the overall um, flow that we adopt for our design. Um, because I said that we develop the software stack and the corresponding hardware for it. We start all the way from the RISC-V tool chain and we modify the source code. We first think of new custom instructions that we might have to add to create such a secure neural network inference. We modify the compiler to identify those custom instructions and then we provide those that, that as a shared library, mnet.so, and then a machine learning model developer can simply write this infer.c compile this whole um, stack along with the firm firmware files using this cross compiler to get the hex file. The hex file is then uh, ported to the memory, which, which also has a RISC-V processor and a coprocessor, which is the main uh, side channel secure inference hardware for us. And this entire thing is then um, ported into the bitstream, which goes into an FPGA, and then we uh, perform all sorts of statistical side channel evaluations. And the goal here is to you know, not have any TVLA leakages, or in other words, prevent any side channel attacks. Okay, so talking about the software APIs, uh, we came up with five software APIs, uh, which are the custom instructions. We extended the risk five, ex uh, the risk five ISA with five instructions using the major and minor opcode fields. Uh, they do leave some uh, encoding spaces specifically for adding such extensions. We specifically use the custom zero extension. And uh, on the left, what I'm showing is how uh, is, is what uh, an application developer would have to do, which is to simply you know, write this for loop, and inside the for loop, there, there could be calls such as fetch input, which, which, which would fetch the input from the host PC or a sensor to the actual hardware, and then it can perform all sorts of um, uh, machine learning operations, such as the input layer, the hidden layer, the output layer. This, we try to keep the semantics similar to the Keras framework, which also works uh, like that. We have stacked layers on top of each other, uh, you know, like a graph fashion, and that makes it easy for a new, uh, for, for a machine learning model developer who's new to this API set to adopt something like this for their solution. Internally, all these APIs, which, uh, so, so we basically develop a software library, and inside that library, we use inline assembly functions, which is where we use these um, newly written um, um, custom instructions such as the MNN config or the MNN I layer, and these are then identified by the RISC V toolchain, which already is aware of these instructions to run the secure neural network inferences. Uh, that's the overall system view for us. Um, that's so the commands are coming via the host PC and then through the UART using a host interface. We translate those commands specifically for what we need to do inside the hardware. The basic flow would be the binary would be first written by the application developer, then the binary would be compiled, and the hex code is first ported to this memory, uh, which is shared between the core and the coprocessor. And then, based on the application uh, sequence, the instruction sequence, the core would be sending numerous instructions to the SNNU unit, which stands for Secure Neural Network Inference Unit. And the neural network inference unit would um, sequentially perform all these operations and then return the result back to the core. So it's like you know a core versus core and coprocessor system. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the reconfigurable data paths that we created. Um, such a design is not trivial. Masking in general is not very trivial. You know, it, it's a very delicate task. If you just um, make a mistake in one particular data path, it will show up in the TVLA leakages. So uh, and and basically because of glitches and other types of defaults in hardware. It's not trivial to have both masking and masked and an unmasked design inside the same design. So we spent a lot of time, we analyzed each of these data paths and ensured that such uh, errors uh, do not exist in our design. For example, you would see how we have registers after the input pixels are arithmetically masked. Now these registers are important because if we don't have these registers before it gets multiplied with the secret weights, there's a small chance that before A gets transformed to A minus R, we, we might just send away the unmasked input pixel. Similarly, uh, we also have uh, registers at the 
input of the masked activation function, and specifically this adder. So if the input layer is unmasked, then I would want to recombine the shares, but I should not be recombining it when the design is masked. And if we don't have these registers, what might happen is that for a very temporary instant in time, we will see unshared values on this adder, and you know that would leak in the TVLA. So using this, there are various data paths also in the hidden layer, in the output layer. We also need to fetch the weights correspondingly. In terms of data reuse, you see two data paths here, right? One is for the masked pixel, and one is for the mask. But when the input layer is unmasked, then we would want, we can really accelerate the design by using both the data paths, right? So we designed this controller, which basically uh, uses the configuration bit and automatically either uses these two data paths for the masked pixels or uses two different pixels directly and accelerates, so, so that would be like half the time that would be taken for uh, what, what would have taken one full cycle for the whole uh, inference of one layer. So it's, it's basically using, reusing the data paths for masking. Uh, now, since we have uh, such a design, we need to exhaustively test it. We performed exhaustive TVLA validations. We used, um, so the top two plots are when the design is unmasked, that's the power plot, and the plot B is the TVLA plot. You would see leakages because the design is unmasked, but when we mask the design, which is the third and the fourth plots, you would see that you see only very small leakages in the input layer. I'll tell you why and the rest of the layers are not showing any TVLA leakages. Now these input layer leakages are not because of an actual leakage in the design, but it's basically the input correlations. So, so if you go back to my design, you would observe that the input pixels are loaded from the memory in each cycle and then masked. So that load operation is what is causing the input correlations. And we have tested this uh, separately by buffering all the input pixels and their masks and then trying out when we don't see any leakages. Now the, third, th now the final two plots are interesting because in the second last plot what I do is I only mask the input and the output layer, which is why you see leakages in the hidden layer. But in the last plot, I only mask the, uh, the hidden layer but keep hidden layer and the input layer, but I let the output layer unmask, which is why you see leakages in the output layer. So we had all these combinations and it was uh, you know, up to our expectations. Uh, based on the reviews we received from uh, the host committee, we also performed actual DPA on the design, on the input layer. As you can see, the left plot is when the design is unmasked and it already leaks at around 6,000 traces, but the masked design on the right does not leak, which is shown here because the correct key guess is hidden within the incorrect key guesses, even for one million traces. We also did comparison with the existing works, and um, uh, I don't know if I have enough time, um, so, so basically what we are trying to, what, what we saw is um, the software uh, solution that existed has a large number of uh, cycles, but the hardware solutions have lesser number of cycles, which is obvious, but our solution, which is the hardware software co-design, it gives a similar performance to the hardware solutions, and it also offers programmability, which is what we need for neural networks, which has a lot of variety in the topologies. To conclude, yeah, we uh, proposed the first hardware software co-design for secure neural network inferences. We uh, added many different innovative features like data path reuse and selective masking, which is very relevant in the context of transfer learning. And this is, and the design is secure in the first order with one million traces, which we have tested with both model-less and model-based uh, le leakage evaluations. Now, this is not in the paper, but we also went ahead and taped, our, taped out our chip using open sourced uh, PDK and EDA flows in the Skywater 130 nanometer technology. And uh, yeah, I would be happy to maybe talk about those results next year. Uh, yeah, and that concludes my talk. Thank you so much. Boyang, uh, University of Cincinnati. Uh, a couple quick questions. Again, sure. A very, very nice presentation. Uh, yeah. Very nice work. Uh, Thank you. So um, I guess my first question is, um, I thank Domingo for your uh, masking design hardware and the uh, software co-design. I think it's to protect the, the weights and parameters of the uh, neural network, if I understand correctly. Right. I guess my question is, does it also protect the architecture? Let's say how many filters I, I could still, you know, reveal from the, the pattern of the 
the yeah. power pad or the end pattern. So. Yeah, so, yeah, so the answer is no, it doesn't, uh, because um, if we go back to the power traces itself, you would see you know, high level features already present. So you can already see how many layers are there in this specific inference. Um, well, my justification here is hyperparameters are also important. Um, but even if an adversary has the hyperparameters, it would still need to train the neural network, right? So that training, and, and that would again require investment. So without having the actual weights and biases, it would not be very advantageous for an adversary. So we focused on the parameters, but hyperparameters are uh, another concern, and that uh, has probably been solved in a few papers uh, using dummy layer insertions. But yeah, we did not focus on that part of the you know threat model. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, so second question, uh, I guess is uh, so if you um, so so how about the um, nonlinear functions, for example, if you have a ReLU, for example, yeah, will that offset or remove your um, masking, for example, will, will that affect the, the, the security or, or the privacy of, of that? Uh, can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. So um, th there was this paper published uh, in chess last year. It was called Modulo Net. Uh, we build on the primitives that were proposed in that paper. And there, what they did was they used um, DOM AND gates, do domain-oriented masking AND gates, and they already have implementations which are masked for the sign function that is being used here. So you can do it bit by bit uh, in a Kogge stone uh, tree fashion and then secure it in the glitch extended probing model. And that, that com gadget was already composable. What we did new in this work is we also proposed a gadget for masked RELU, which only requires one DOM gadget because it's equivalent to an AND function uh, over many bits. And we also proposed a masking gadget for max pool. And I guess you can probably check the paper for more details. So nonlinear functions are also not a problem in our work. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. I'm assuming that uh, you are creating the neural network from scratch. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So you just binarize neural network with the uh, weights and activations. Right. So, uh, what do you think? Why do you think there is a need to uh, create a network from scratch and not use the other libraries that are already there? That are self-made neural networks are there. Or did you use those uh, libraries in your work? Uh, are you talking about software libraries or hardware libraries? I'm talking about software libraries. You mean TensorFlow and Keras? Yeah, yeah. I see. So. Um, so yeah, so that is a good next step. What I have done would require someone to write code in C++. We can obviously move this up to the Python level. Um, but I believe the problem there is these libraries, if you want to, let's say, move it on to you know, some proprietary hardware. So let's say we are using TensorFlow for running some neural network on an edge TPU. Uh, that would not be possible if you do not have access to the compiler. Because yeah. all you can do is change the Python code, and the mm -hmm. Python code will always just map to unshared operations on hardware. So you will need to build the whole software stack. I mean, machine learning was not really developed keeping security in mind, right? It was all about performance. Yes. So what we are doing is fundamentally different from what already exists, which is why we have to create the whole software stack. So a good next step would be to extend the stack to uh, a Python-based framework. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Andrew, for your nice talk. Our final talk before lunch uh, is um, a dual leap. Um, um, let's welcome our, our third uh, speaker. Uh, unfortunately, our third speaker couldn't travel because of uh, his final exam. And uh, other authors also couldn't travel uh, because of some other duties. So uh, uh, Dr. Goes, uh, you know, he is uh, volunteering uh, this paper. So he's not uh, the author of this paper, but he's helping the authors to present this paper. Um, <coughs> Dr. Uh, uh, Xiaolong Go is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Kansas State University. He earned his PhD in Electrical and Computer Engineering from, from University of Florida in 2019. Dr. Guo's research uh, expertise uh, includes formal verification, cross-layer security, and hardware-software co-verification. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Guo for his talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, so this work is made by the Mr. Hong Gang Yu and his colleague, uh, his, his collaborators from the University of Florida, the Michigan Technological University, and the Thirty K. So my research area is not in the the uh, study channel. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact um, Mr. Hong Gang Yu and his collaborators. So the topic I want to share today is the dual link. De deep and supervised active learning for cross device profiled set channel leakage. And uh, through the name, you can find that, uh, yeah, thanks for the Dr. Wang's triplet uh, power and Yin Kai's uh, dual channel power EIM. Yeah. So basically, this work and the, their, uh, their two work share the same background, similar background. So I will quickly go through the motivation and the type background part and then go straight forward to the methodology and then tell details about the experiment. Okay, let's start. Uh, yeah, for the uh, machine learning algorithm, we know that it's popular and uh, very useful now, so let's skip that part. And uh, if we hope to use that in the side channel attack, then the profile uh, side channel analysis, analysis, the working procedure is like this. So we have the device A uh, in the local from a tiger side, and then we hope to attack the device B. Then we collect the uh, data from the device A, and then build the model, and then after getting very few traces from the device B, we can finish the attack. That's the existing uh, DNN-based profile, the SCA basic procedure. And of course, it uh, includes a lot of problems, including like the, uh, the huge complexity and also uh, the, uh, the, the difference of the uh, uh, design of the devices, uh, and also the need of the huge amount of the SCA traces. Uh, and uh, to solve that problem, if there are uh, uh, anything new for this work, uh, based on my understanding, is the active learning, which means that uh, the author added a pre-processed method be after getting the traces from the devices. And uh, using this pre-processing, the uh, data could be refined, and then we will get a very efficient achievement so that we can have a better performance and a lower complexity. So the, for the active learning, the, there are several strategies listed here. The first is a random sampling. It's the easiest one, which means that after we get the traces, then all the traces will be utilized for training the model. And then the next is the uncertainty sampling. In this method, the filter algorithm is like we select a subset from the, all the traces we collected, and those subsets must, following the, must follow the rule of uh, it needs to achieve a max, uh, maximality uh, uncertainty. And then the next is K30 uh, center sampling. For this sampling, it utilizes the greedy K uh, center algorithm to choose the, to the, the subset of the uh, set channel analysis traces. And also, another sampling method is a deep four based active learning. So in this method, uh, we add a particular noise. The particular noise means that the noise follow a direct, uh, a specific direction so that the data could move to some in, uh, in some direction and then use them to construct the traces database. And also the author developed some combined strategy, which means that it includes two stages of filtering. The first stage use one sampling uh, method, and then after that, use another filtering method, sampling method to deal with the data. For instance, first, after getting all the traces, we use the uncertainty filtering to, uh, to reduce the, 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 the data size, and then after that, use the case center algorithm to refine the data again. That's the basic idea. And the author tested several combinations, and the last combination, the DFAL plus K-Center, those combinations have been proved to be the, most, the, the, the highest performance. And uh, for those combinations, an uh, ex explanation is that for the DFAL, uh, those methods push all data to approach to the boundary, the decision boundary, and then use those data to be the data size for training the model. Uh, so that the, the model can have a better performance. So that's the basic idea of uh, the active learning. And uh, utilizing the active learning to, uh, to, to be uh, in the uh, side channel attack uh, to uh, recover the key from 
both the power and the uh, EM side channel channel information. Yes, this method considering bo considers both power side channel and also the EM side channel. The cross device in this method means we train the data from one device and then at, uh, attack another device. The cross domain means uh, we train the data by using the power traces or EM traces and then attack uh, the, 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 the victim device based on the other data set, uh, the, the, the different physical measurement like the EM and the power. Uh, so here is the block diagram of the author's uh, uh, method. Uh, so the di main difference is that you can find that at the middle, uh, uh, active learning in short AL algorithm is inserted. Uh, and in this stage, the uh, traces collected from the profiling device and also uh, some traces also collected from the at attacking uh, victim devices. Those data traces will be pre-filled, uh, will be pre-processed using the sampling method we introduced uh, before in this AL algorithm. And then the result will be utilized to form this data set and then uh, to refine the deep learning model. And then this model will be provided to the attacker to perform the, the, the attack. That's the basic description of the method. And then let's focus on the experiment setup. For the experiment, uh, since it's cross divide devices, therefore we're considering uh, five devices in total, including like SMT32 and ATXM EJA devices. Uh, and also, since this method considers both EM and power, therefore you can find that the 3D position system uh, and the R2EM probe is utilized, are utilized to collect the information of the EM set channel and the chip whisper platform is utilized to collect the power traces. Uh, and then the result will be collected by the uh, oscilloscope and then used, used to, the, to analyze. Uh, here is the result. And the first column, we listed uh, uh, five different devices and uh, including 32-bit micro microprocessor and 8-bit microprocessor. And then on the fourth column, we can find that different ISC are supported by those uh, devices. And then the fifth column, the features means for each uh, trace, we consider each uh, 700 uh, uh, sampling points uh, to be the features of the deep learning method. And then in the last column, we show the data we collected uh, for, uh, for each device. For instance, in the first row for the device STM32F0, we collect 30K uh, traces for both power and EM. Then, based on those data, we started, uh, the author starts the, uh, his uh, uh, experiment. So, in this page, uh, it's an experiment. The, on the right and the left side figure, it's a correlation shape between uh, the profiling device and targeting device. The X uh, axis means the targeting or victim devices, the device we hope to attack. And the Y axis is the profiling uh, device, which means that attacker own this device locally and they can collect any data, any data they want from these profiling devices. We can find that, uh, okay, so this darkness means that it's a variation of the uh, relationship between those two devices. The, dark, the more darkness the color is, the, 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 the more easier the attacker can uh, get the key. Uh, so that you can find that if we train the data and uh, then attack the device using the same device, of course, it's the most easiest one. Uh, but uh, for crossing the devices, it's a little bit harder, but it's doable. And also, on the right side of the figure, it shows that how many traces we need to collect in the attacking stage, how many traces we need to get from the victim device so that we can uh, get the key out. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, you can find that there are only a uh, few traces we, uh, in, uh, required for uh, attacking the, uh, 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 the, the victim device successfully, um, almost around several tens. Uh, so this is the experiment. And uh, then the author considers using different uh, sampling strategies, the uh, active learning strategies, in the 
uh, result on the left top, left top is a very original set channel attack. You can find that uh, almost five thousand cases are needed for getting the key, and then uh, the rest of the uh, result shows that if we use the uh, let me see, the, the, the fee, the random, uh, so it's almost the same. So uh, uh, also again, 5,000 uh, cases are needed. But then using some other strategies like uh, the uncertainty consider and the DFAL, the performance become be uh, becomes better. So fewer cases are needed to perform uh, the attack. And then from the F to each, you can find that if we combine the sampling strategy together, then the challenging level for getting the key is reduced significantly, especially the last one. For the last one, if we use the DFAL to process the data and then use the key center to process the data twice uh, again, then only several tens of the cases are needed for getting the key. And here is a comparison between the authors do leak and other existing uh, attacks. Uh, so the, in the last row, I put we put the author do leak, uh, the result here. So basically, uh, the do leak does not need the attacking labels, and then does not need the pre-processing like doing the FFT or UNET. And uh, a significant result is shown in the last column. So uh, so we can find that the proposed do leak only need uh, around uh, ten or twenty traces to get the key. Uh, so that's the result uh, of uh, the author's do leak approach. And then, so this slide, uh, the author tried another very interesting uh, experiment, like how about we train the data uh, using the power uh, trace, and then get the EM traces from the victim device, and then using that trace, trace as a tag. You can find that on the uh, result A, uh, almost uh, several tens of traces are needed to perform this cross-domain attack. And then, uh, in, the, uh, in the result of the B, of again, so the, the traces needed for, uh, for performing this cross-domain attack is, is also not, does, does not need many traces. Uh, but for the uh, figure C, it's a little bit different because you can find that for either A or B, the victim device are considered in the training, uh, uh, tra uh, in the training procedure, but for the C, the author utilized the public database, so which means that those data had not been considered in the training uh, procedure, uh, and in that case, still the proposed the uh, method get uh, uh, the uh, a little bit worse result than A and B, but it's, it's better than the original uh, set channel analysis. Uh, so that's the result from the author, and uh, so as a conclusion, this uh, method developed a cross-domain and uh, cross-devices uh, profiled set channel attack, and the active learning is utilized to reduce the complexity and uh, 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 also improve the, uh, the, the, the performance of the set channel attack. So that's all I want to share here. So if you have any questions, please uh, reach out to Mr. Ho Wang Yu for more details. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Go, for uh, good work and good presentations. Uh, uh, let's uh, conclude this uh, session, and we have now a lunch break. Uh, enjoy your lunch. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>